Good day everyone, Dr Polaris here. Well, it's back to the Triassic for this episode, where we'll be examining another bizarre archosaur radiation, the Tanistrophiids. But first, I think we should take a quick look at the archosaur family tree, as it is quite extensive and can get confusing at times. The oldest and most basal members of this lineage split from the Lepidosaurs, the lizards, snakes, Tuatara and their extinct relatives, likely during the early Permian. By the middle Permian, the oldest archosaur relatives appear in the fossil record, being small, rare, monitor lizard-like predators. These were not members of the more familiar crocodile or bird-line archosaurs that are still with us today. Instead, these were far more basal animals, and part of a clade known as Archosauromorpha. Exactly which Permian and Triassic reptiles fall into this grouping changes with almost every new academic study. But there are a few mainstays, including the early primitive Enigmastrophius, the long-necked Proterosaurus, and the cryptic semi-aquatic Tristoderans. All of these creatures are generally fairly small, carnivorous or insectivorous reptiles, with slender builds, smallish heads and active lifestyles. In more recent years, another group within Archosauromorpha has been recognised, the Tanistrophiids. These were an extinct family of mostly marine or at least shore-dwelling reptiles that lived throughout the Triassic period. They are characterised by their long, stiff necks formed from elongated cervical vertebrae with very long cervical ribs. Some Tanistrophiids, such as the famous Tanistrophius itself, had necks that were several metres long, longer than the rest of their bodies in fact. These animals are known from Europe, Asia, North America and probably South America. The presence of Tanistrophiids in Europe and China indicate that they lived along much of the coastline of ancient Pangaea. However, species in Western North America are found in terrestrial deposits, suggesting that, as a group, Tanistrophiids were ecologically diverse. Like other basal archosauromorphs, Tanistrophiids were generally slender, leggy and fornivorous animals. All possessed long necks, sometimes ridiculously so, and judging from the location of their fossils, appear to have favoured shoreline ecosystems. However, this was not always the case, as we will see later on. Overall, they were a successful and adaptable lineage, lasting for the entirety of the Triassic period, and adapting to a wide variety of niches. The most basal Tanistrophiids were all rather small, being less than 50 centimetres long. Indeed, some were tiny, the genus Cosesaurus is known from fossil imprints of a single small skeleton, which was found in the Muschelskalk outcrops near the municipalities of Monral and Alcova in Spain. These outcrops are dated to the Landinian age of the Middle Triassic, about 242 to 237 million years ago. Overall, this poorly preserved and likely juvenile specimen measured just 14 centimetres long, that's 5.5 inches, with adults speculated to have reached roughly 40 centimetres. It was a gracile animal, resembling a narrow-headed lizard with short forelimbs and elongated hind limbs. The skull was moderately elongated, with proportionately large juvenile eyes, and with numerous tiny pointed teeth in its jaws. The hind legs of the Cosesaurus specimen are longer than the forelimbs, indicating that it was possibly, but not certainly, bipedal. Sanz and Lopez Martinez used a proportional tool, known as Galton's Index, to investigate this possibility. Originating with Peter Galton in a 1976 study of basal sauropodomorph locomotion, this index compares the length of the entire hind limb to that of the animal's body, not including the neck or tail. The Cosesaurus specimen was found to have a ratio of 1.21, which was larger than the solely quadrupedal primitive squamate relatives, but smaller than the solely bipedal early theropods like Coelophysis. This could indicate some degree of bipedal movement, but the specimen has also been hypothesised to be a juvenile. In modern crocodiles, the Galton index shrinks from 1.06 to 0.79 between hatchlings and adults. If the ratio shrank to the same extent in Cosesaurus, 
they likely passed out of the range allowing for bipedalism by the time they reached adulthood. The poor preservation and likely juvenile nature of the specimen has led to the anatomy of Cosesaurus being misidentified by several different sources. For example, Paul Ellenberger claimed that it was an ancestor of birds in the 1970s, while David Peters claimed that it was a pterosaur ancestor in 2000. Both of these claims contrast with mainstream scientific theories on the origins of either group, and paleontologists who study the specimen are unable to find the features which Ellenberger or Peters reported to be present. The Ellenberger and Peter hypotheses are thus considered fringe theories, with questionable scientific soundness due to their low reproductibility. Indeed, when looking up information on many groups of Triassic reptiles, you are likely to find seemingly high-quality illustrations produced by David Peters. Please don't be misled by the information posted by Peters on his Reptile Evolution website. The man is a proven crank that believes that only he has the correct skills to analyse fossils, while dismissing experts such as Darren Naish as corrupt ivory tower bigots. Anyway, the body structure of Cosesaurus was common among basal tanistrophiids. The genus Langobardisaurus from late Triassic Italy was quite similar in appearance, being about 50 centimetres long. It too possessed elongated hind limbs, a relatively long neck, and a smallish triangular skull with large orbits. The front part of the jaws were toothless and superficially beak-like, but toward the rear of the jaws were powerful, flattened, molariform teeth. Additionally, the lower jaw was robust and had a high coronoid process, which suggests the capability of a powerful bite. Given this and its distinct tooth pattern, these traits suggest that the reptile performed excessive grinding of its food. In an analysis of the Langobardisaurus jaw and tooth morphology, Renestro and Dallavecchia speculated that the genus survived on a diet of large insects, crustaceans and small fish with tough scales. Additionally, it has been hypothesised that Langobardisaurus used its long neck to pluck insects out of the air, in addition to burying its head deep into burrows to capture fleeing crustacean prey. This makes sense given that the animal lived in a warm, subtropical coastal region of northern Pangaea while alive. The elongated hind limbs of Langobardisaurus indicate that it was capable of some form of bipedal locomotion, this was undoubtedly a significant advantage, as such an adaptation would have allowed the animal to chase after prey and flee from predators. Based on the hypothesis that Langobardisaurus fed on insects, crustaceans and fish, the ability to run after prey afforded it a significant increase in its hunting capabilities, even if it was only able to do so in short bursts. Several other basal Tanistrophia genera shared this sort of lifestyle and ecology. However, a number of significantly more derived members of the family existed in the Triassic. Among two possible members that fell into this classification were the strange gliding Ozimek and Charovipteryx. The former was a small animal with a length of about 90 centimetres. Its limbs were long, with the hind limbs being generally much longer than the forelimbs, and its feet were large and powerful. The limbs likely supported a membrane of skin that was used for gliding between trees. Although skull material attributed to the animal is fragmentary, we know that Ozimek was likely an insectivore due to its small, sharp teeth. Known from the Triassic of Poland, it lived alongside the crocodile-like phytosaurs, predatory Rhyosuchians, and the dinosauromorph Silosaurus. It was a close relative of the much more famous Charovipteryx, known from similarly aged rocks of Kyrgyzstan. This genus was similar to its Polish cousin, with incredibly elongated hind limbs, tiny forelimbs and a long thin tail. The holotype and only known fossil of Charovipteryx is very well preserved in dorsal view and largely complete, with the bones still articulated and impressions of some of the integument being present. A thin membrane of skin stretched between the hind limbs with a much smaller patagium extending between the forelimbs as well. The reptile could glide using this patagium, and stabilised its glide by changing the angles of its forelimbs to provide an aeronautic canard, or by bending its tail up or down to produce drag. The wing membrane, 
which stretched between its very long hind legs and tail, would have allowed it to glide as a delta wing aircraft does. Such a body plan is very different from living gliding animals, which generally possess elongated forelimbs. The fact that Ozimek and Sharovipteryx were the only known gliders to do this is yet another example of Triassic archosaur weirdosity. Speaking of strangeness, it is now that we will turn to examine the most famous and eponymous member of this group, Tanistrophius. While the smaller, more basal genera either inhabited forests, in the case of the hind leg gliders, or beaches, Tanistrophius was perhaps a more marine animal. Measuring up to six metres long, with about half of that length made up of just the neck, this was by far the largest member of Tanistrophiidae. The neck was composed of 12 to 13 extremely elongated vertebrae. With its very long but relatively stiff neck, Tanistrophius has been often proposed and reconstructed as an aquatic or semi-aquatic reptile, a theory supported by the fact that the creature is most commonly found in semi-aquatic fossil sites, where known terrestrial reptile remains are rare. Complete skeletons of juvenile individuals are most abundant in the Bessano Formation of Italy. Other fossils have been found in the Middle East and China, dating to 232 million years ago during the Middle Triassic. Initially considered to be some kind of pterosaur during the 19th century, influential early paleontologist Franz Nopska rather interestingly restored Tanistrophius as a long-tailed gliding animal. Given recent proposals that Ozimek and Sharovipteryx were in the same family, this is a fascinating example of art imitating later discoveries. Aside from its ridiculously long neck and small head, this genus also possessed short forelimbs but robust hindquarters, suggesting that the centre of mass for Tanistrophius was closer towards the pelvic girdle. Attachment sites for the M. chordofemoratus muscle complex, coupled with soft tissue preservation of relative muscle size, further supports the proposition that Tanistrophius was a fairly bottom-heavy animal. The diet of Tanistrophius has been controversial in the past, although most recent studies consider it a piscivorous fish-eating reptile. The teeth at the front of the narrow snout were long, conical and interlocking, similar to those of nothosaurs and plesiosaurs. This was likely an adaptation for catching aquatic prey. Additionally, Hooks from cephalopod tentacles and what may be fish scales have been found near the belly regions of some specimens, further supporting a piscivorous lifestyle. However, exactly how Tanistrophius went about catching prey has been a matter of extensive debate over the years. In the 1980s, various studies determined that Tanistrophius lacked the musculature to raise its neck above the ground, and that it was likely completely aquatic swimming by undulating its body in a side-to-side -side motion like a snake or a crocodile. However, in 2005, Renesto found that Tanistrophius lacked many aquatic adaptations. Although the tail of Tanistrophius was flattened, it was compressed from top to bottom, so that it would have been useless for side-to-side -side movement. In 2015, paleoartist Mark Whitten concluded that, although the neck made up half of the animal's entire length, it only made up 20% of the animal's entire mass, due to having light and hollow vertebrae. In comparison, the heads and necks of pterosaurs of the family Asdarkidae made up almost 50% of the animal's mass, yet they were clearly land-based carnivores. The animal is also poorly equipped for aquatic life, with the only adaptation being a lengthened fifth toe, which suggests that it visited the water some of the time, though was not wholly dependent on it. The same research has also shown that Tanistrophius would have hunted prey like a heron, which indicates that the preservation of Tanistrophius specimens is more similar to the terrestrial Macronemus than the aquatic Serpaniosaurus, which all occur together in the same sites. Renesto and Franco Sella's 2018 follow-up article offered more information on the reconstructed musculature of Tanistrophius. The study determined that the first few tail vertebrae of the animal would have housed powerful tendons and ligaments which would have made the body more stiff, keeping the belly off the ground and preventing the neck from pulling the body over. In addition, 
the hind legs would have been quite flexible and powerful according to muscle correlations on the legs, pelvis and tail vertebrae. This analysis shows that Tanistrophius was capable of a specific mode of movement while swimming. Namely, the animal could extend its hind limbs forwards and then simultaneously retract them, creating a powerful jump forwards. Further support for this hypothesis lies in the fact that a close relative of Tanistrophius, perhaps the small Tanitrachalos, is believed to have left a form of track known as Gwynadichnium. Gwynadichnium ichnofossil tracks are characterised by a succession of paired footprints which can be assigned to the hind limbs, but with no handprints. These tracks are almost certainly created by the same form of movement, which Renesto and Sala theorise was the preferred form of swimming in Tanistrophius. With this information, the most likely lifestyle for this animal was that it was a shallow water predator, which used its long neck to stealthily approach schools of fish or squid without disturbing the prey due to its large body size. Upon selecting a suitable prey item, it would have dashed forwards by propelling itself along the seabed or through the water, with both hind limbs pushing off at the same time. However, this style of swimming is most common in amphibious creatures such as frogs, and likewise Tanistrophius also would have been capable of walking around on land. The idea that Tanistrophius evolved this form of swimming over the much more efficient yet specialised styles is evidence that it did not live as an exclusively aquatic lifestyle as in most other marine reptiles such as ichthyosaurs or plesiosaurs. And with that, we conclude this look at one of the Triassic's many oddball lineages of archosaur relatives. I will come back to this topic in the near future, but next week I'll be covering a new series of cryptids in a rather different location to the jungles and plains of Africa. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon. Cheerio!